And now we are going to have the pleasure and the provocation, I suppose, of listening to Joseph Kerner giving the third of his lectures on the evidence of images, Kentridge. Welcome again, Joseph. Thank you very much for that moving, generous introduction. Um, so we've been exploring in the first two lectures uh, the evidence that images give, as well as the evidence art historians bring to bear on images in their scholarship and in pedagogy. Following Gombrich, we have also approached the question of evidence in its other meaning as the quality of being evident and conspicuous. Images can make something else evident, an object, a message, a mystery. Grasping correctly that reference can require external evidence in the form, say, of relevant texts and contexts. Physically present before the eyes and plain to see, however, images are also self-evident. Max Beckmann's self-portrait harnessed this property in remarkable ways. It put its living subject immediately before me and although I adduced some evidence about the painting's purpose and about the inconstant history of its effects or reception, evidence that can enrich our experience of the work, the image exerts a force somehow independent of all of that. As material presences, images achieve their effects presently. Ambitious image makers work with this fact. In his elusive triptych, Hieronymus Bosch conjured a human world devoid of human artifacts. This kept his artifact always contemporary and ongoing, baffling art historians about its place and time. It was the uncanny force of images that fascinated Abbe Warburg and that he affirmed in the cryptic motto for a projected psychology of art, du lebst und tust mir nichts, you live and do me no harm. Addressing the image in the intimate, friendly du, Warburg celebrates it as a safe space where at a distance from the annihilating immediacy of things, human thought can flourish and evolve. This institute and this library that bears his name is a concrete embodiment of such a space. But the phrase, you do me no harm, references a state of emergency in which images sometimes circulate. Like Beckmann's canvas, the Warburg Institute is a refugee escaped from a dangerous order that deemed it an enemy. Enmity can be the image's natural element. Bosch's paintings don't simply seem to live. They shout beware and they threaten to do me harm, either as conduits of God's wrath or as devilish traps or as the two intertwined. Today, we'll turn from the art of the past to, the, to current artistic practice. We'll explore the output of a contemporary maker who is centrally engaged with questions of evidence and of the abiding form of evidence that images specifically give. To begin, I'd like to consider a work in which images, are, however, are conspicuously absent. These handmade leaves look to be blank pages awaiting use. But the title warns that something's already there, something that's labeled evidence, and it will predictably therefore be obscure. Handled with care and scrutinized, the sheets reveal their secret, images deposited not on the page, but in the page. In the words of the uh, work's publisher, quote, the sheets of evidence, uh, the concept of the sheets of evidence was to create a book whose surface reveals nothing and instead to encourage the viewer to look beneath the surface quite literally. The content is only visible upon turning the pages such that the angle of light would allow the viewer to see its drawing or text in watermarked paper. Dedicated to uh, hand paper making as an art form, uh, Dieudonné Press collaborates with artists to translate their ideas into this medium. Making, paint, making, making paper inspires artists to think differently about making more generally. Sheets of evidence is an anomaly, even in an oeuvre as diverse as that of William Kentridge. 
Although paper in all its varieties is this South African artist's prima materia, paper making becomes his medium only in this one case. And what Kentridge tends to put on paper, whether in charcoal, ink, or collage, tends to be highly conspicuous. Working almost exclusively in black and white, with color limited to small, targeted marks of red and blue, his work aspires to the stark visibility of shadow projections, the opposite, in other words, of visually tenuous watermarks. Yet, as Kentridge has affirmed, the power of materials themselves uh, 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 exert a force to generate images. The studio, he writes, is, quote, a space for uncertainty, for giving an impulse, an object, a material, the benefit of the doubt, allowing a space for the medium to lead and giving yourself over to play. Kentridge produced the original drawing collages for sheets of evidence in the form of drawings like this. These were scanned, digitalized, and cut into rubber watermarks, which were glued to wove molds. Sheets were formed with short cotton linter pulp pressed to 2,300 pounds per square inch. Many of the resulting images are of kissing and copulation. These playfully recollect the compression that engendered them. The images also activate a second uh, meaning of the book's title. Sexual liaisons happen, of course, between sheets made of cotton, potentially even of cut up bed sheets. Paper is a sheet in this double sense, and the watermarks have the embedded character of the stubbornly evident stains left behind by lovemaking. The fluidity of Kentridge's drawings supports this idea. Uh, here, uh, this, a, uh, the original sketch with its pooled and splattered ink beside the watermark facsimile. Note also the motif, a woman with a bath sheet in a tub of water. Degas wrote of his many bathing nudes, quote, it is as though you were looking through a keyhole, end quote. Here you actually have to look through the page to see the image. The work is replete with puns and innuendos. The word lies, meaning to rest or remain, gets used in three ways. Isolated and capitalized, the word also summons its alternative sense, lies as false statements. Both meanings of the word apply. Resting hidden on the page, words and images lie in store, in wait, and asleep. Here they also conceal their own evidence. This is a play of uh, a game of projection and association that the book invites us to join. Phrases like mechanical movements, problems with coupling, and three in the bed wink towards images that are themselves suggested, suggestive. Because nothing is self-evident, everything gets forensically scrutinized as evidence, and the sexual activity that our detective work brings to light explains why they might be concealed. But beyond the erotic secrets that the sheets evidence, there also remains the larger question of evidence as a quality, that is, of the particular presence of those marks made not on, but of their support. The blank sheet of paper awaits its marks, writes Kentridge. There's an urge, an impulse to, mark, uh, to, uh, to make the mark. For a compulsive draftsman, 21 sheets of pristine handmade paper would pose a temptation were they not labeled as already marked. A sheet left blank has its own mystery. In Kentridge's words, it is a Robert Ryman of possibilities. Instead of looking through the image on the surface to what the image seems to represent, everything is now a projection from the eye forward. Drawing may work with the precept of the sheet of paper as a membrane between the world and ourselves, but as Kentridge reports, quote, the seeing into the blank sheet is familiar to me. Formed as if spontaneously out of a single line, this still life exemplifies the draftsman's primary impulse to make a mark, but it is visible only by seeing into the blank sheet. Quote, it's not the drawing it's not that a drawing superimposes itself on the surface. The shape we will find only when we start to draw, a mixture of making and looking." End quote. Before the story about lovemaking and voyeurism, 
there exists a story about art making and spectatorship. The protagonist is bo of both tales, both the procreative and the creative, makes his appearance on the penultimate sheet, this loosely sketched self-portrait. Its page turned, the likeness gives way to a skull. This is the, sheep's, she, uh, the book's final sheet, its macabre colophon. The conceit is a venerable one. The twin powers of Eros and Thanatos converge on the figure of the artist. Here we realize that Kentridge has been the lover all along. Anonymous in the earlier sketches, he becomes in death anonymous again. And yet, Sheets of Evidence whispers a memento mori throughout. The artwork vanishes into the page. But returning as artists urge us to do, back from absence to presence, it's relevant that viewers can identify the scribble as William Kentridge's face. The physiognomy and pince nez will be recognizable to anyone the least bit familiar with this artist oeuvre, because like Beckman, he is a most dedicated self-portraitist. Sometimes these likenesses are cheerfully oblique. This tapestry was woven after an original collage by Kentridge. Titled Self-Portrait as a Coffee Pot, it parodies the role-playing common in artist's likeness. Remember Beckman as statesman and as clown. The stovetop espresso maker looks vaguely human. I see a one-armed one Cossack. And through its placement and association with caffeine, it also conjures the sitter's stimulated brain. The megaphone adds a mouth and thus a voice to the collage text. The megaphone and Bialati recur as motifs throughout the artist's work. They are also equipment actually occurring in his Johannesburg studio. They appear in the 2012 Universal Archive lino cuts and in the 2013 uh, rebus sculptures, cast bronzes that change from one object to another when viewed from different angles. Those are actually the same bronzes turned around so you see an alternative uh, object in them. Demonstration instruments of the variability of vision, these pieces prove that, as Gombrich put it, quote, visual evidence never comes unmixed with imagination. The tapestry applies this principle to what seems most resistant, the self-portrait. Artist likenesses typically celebrate the maker's sovereignty rather than the beholder's share. Prompted by the title and by the hands and feet, it's we, the viewer, who mentally construct the figure of the maker from the loose collages of sketches by Kentridge. And this makes historical sense, because ever since its origin as a genre during the Renaissance, Self-portraiture has always publicized what artists claim about their products generally. Each work is an image of the talent, style, and sensibility of its maker. Coffee pot, megaphone, feet, and hands aren't objects. As the text at the upper left explains, these weavings of Kentridge's sketches are, quote, unreliable witnesses of the object. They're things observed by the artist in his signature way. The maker becomes a viewer of coffee pots, while the viewer, asked to solve the puzzle, becomes the maker. The tapestry has more direct precedence. Hieronymus Bosch left us no signed self-portraits, but he did cre create encrypted ones. From one perspective, this beautiful drawing visualizes an old proverb, quote, the trees have eyes and the field has ears, but the wise man keeps his counsel. From another perspective, punning on the Flemish word bos as forest, and via the owl, sometimes called a bosvogel, the scene adds up to a hybrid portrait of the maker, Bosch, who is also famous for hybrids. The proverb's ears and eyes gather a persona that confronts us eerily. Kentridge, too, represents himself as a persona or a fiction. The series of 10 animated films titled Drawings for Projection are his most famous creation. In the first and fourth films, he gives his feature to the character of Felix Teitelbaum. A solitary dreamer, Felix fantasizes about a Mrs. Eckstein with whom he has an adulterous affair. Her husband, Soho Eckstein, is a ruthless man of industry. Kentridge dr dressed Eckstein in the pinstripe suit of his grandfather, Morris Kentridge. In later films, as the artist has aged, 
Felix dropped from the story and Soho came to resemble William Kentridge. Opposites who love the same woman, Felix and Soho might represent two sides of one personality. However, it would be reductive to imagine them as adding up to a portrait of Kentridge. Archetypes of white South Africa, their resemblance to the artist is part confession, part expediency. Creating his films alone in his studio over many months, he naturally used his own person as a readily available model. Kentridge made, makes his drawings for, pro, for projection by a process he terms Stone Age filmmaking. Instead of using different drawings for each frame as an ordinary animation, he alters a, uh, one drawing bit by bit, the same drawing, beginning with a strong meter-wide meter sheet of blank paper tacked to the studio wall, he draws in charcoal the opening image. With a camera set some feet away, he shoots three frames, walks back to the drawing, adds or erases one tiny element, then returns to the camera to shoot three more frames, and so on for hundreds of shots. Between the drawing and the camera, Kentridge is perpetually present, yet he never intrudes into drawings for projection, not only because that's not part of the concept, but because while clicking the shutter, he steps out of frame. However, with small modifications, the setup in his studio can easily capture Kentridge at work. I first encountered Kentridge's work at the Albertina in Vienna. Our young children were rushing us through the exhibition, but grabbing our attention was a spellbinding mix of animation and live action footage that showed the artist making a self-portrait in reverse. Seven Fragments for Georges Méliès treats the studio as a kind of home for uh, images. Exploring the activity and history of image making, it has as its center the artist, a man simply dressed in black and white, working masterfully in black and white. Kentridge's black trousers, white cotton shirt, and pince nez serve as a uniform like Beckman's black and white tuxedo. Working in ink and charcoal on paper, he can merge with his imagery with his white shirt, sometimes splattered with paint. Worn in public, in lectures and interviews, the uniform suggests that Kentridge has stepped briefly out of his studio or that his appearance may itself be a work of art. The clothes are also practical, easy to launder and to replace. They allow the artist always to look the same so that if he allows himself to be filmed, the footage will retain continuity shot to shot, year after year. It becomes apparent why Kentridge should appear between the sheets of evidence. He's always inside his imagery. In his flipbook films, he takes pleasure in this presence, acrobatically somersaulting between the pages and erotically tumbling between the sheets. Freud had a term uh, for the analytical situation as a playground, in German, a tumulplatz, where patients could safely tackle the pathological secrets of their unconscious. Reclining on a couch in the closed space of the consulting room with Persian tapestries and ancient artifacts to inspire them, clients had only to follow one playground rule, that they immediately say what comes into their heads, selecting and avoiding nothing, even when it seems unpleasant, irrelevant, or stupid. The doctor sitting silently behind the couch functions as a blank sheet on which the patient could project or transfer a forgotten past. In Freud's words, this transference created, quote, an intermediate region between sickness and real life through which the transition from one, from sickness, to the other, real life, is made. For Kentridge, the studio is similarly a, quote, safe space for stupidity. Those are his words. But in the studio, the artist both makes and beholds, thus combining patient and doctor into one. The artist's omnipresence affects the image's testimony. Kentridge's art comes with an interpreter attached. His testimony may not be completely reliable, but its intelligence and scope affect what evidence, if any, art historians need additionally to supply. This is the situation with contemporary art more generally. Historians can question the artist directly. As art history becomes increasingly focused on, on the contemporary, problems of evidence like those posed by Bosch will become increasingly quaint. 
But it's not simply that Kentridge can supply most of the evidence needed. In his art, and through his copious writings, interviews, and lectures, he has addressed in original way the question of evidence more generally, situating that question explicitly in the wider spheres of cognition, law, and politics. Four years ago, Kentridge delivered the Norton Lectures at Harvard. He spoke from the same stage where, in 1947, Panofsky gave his Norton Lectures, as you'll recall. Kentridge warned his audience that being an artist, he would necessarily move from the image to the idea. That is, the evidence of images was primary, and thoughts about images would have to follow from the image. The first images he showed were part of a 1994 film titled Shadow Procession, and here a short clip. To move from these powerful images to their potential idea, Kentridge took his audience back almost two and a half millennia to the classical authority on images and ideas, Plato. It was never clear whether while making Shadow Procession, the artist had the allegory of, cave, of the cave specifically in mind. The cave is an image or figure that Socrates, in Plato's dialogue, The Republic, asks us mentally to behold. And it is indeed richly analogous to the scenario of Kentridge's film. Shadow Procession debuted in an ancient underground cistern in Istanbul, so the original experience would have been distinctly ca cavernous. In Plato, the shadow play consists of, quote, men carrying all sorts of gear behind a curtain wall, with the gear projecting above that curtain, and including figures of men and animals made of stone and wood. That's Plato, end quote. It is the procession of gear in Socrates' description that projected as shadows by a fire that burns at the back of the cave behind the viewers who are long, lifelong prisoners in the cave that one sees. So it's the, it's the gear that gets projected. Chained and bound, they can watch those shadows and nothing else. Kendridge changes this scenography. He shows shadows of the gear and of the people who carry the gear. These porters are, in Kentridge's words, quote, a catalog of people on the move, specific people seen in newspapers and on the streets of Johannesburg, end quote. They also have recent, uh, they have recent echoes in migrants struggling to make their way to Europe, often by foot. This shift, showing the porters, opens up the puppetry for exploration. Socrates left this realm behind, his tale only tells of one prisoner who, released from his bonds, sees the shadow casting objects and the fire, and ascends by force to the real world above. There he learns to behold in succession shadows, reflections, objects, the stars, and finally the sun. Kentridge had two concerns in revisiting Plato's cave. His first concern was political. This accords with the purpose of Plato's Republic, the prisoner's progress from shadows to sunlight, as from falsehood to truth, constitutes explicitly a lesson about politics. Plato wants to prove that the just polis 
should be ruled by the philosopher king uh, who is enlightened by knowledge of the ideas. Kentridge, Kentridge responds with lessons drawn from his historical experience, quote, we have reached the point where all destinations, all bright lights arouse mistrust. The light at the end of the tunnel turns too quickly into the interrogator's spotlight, end quote. This skepticism derives from what he takes to be the primary political manifestation of enlightenment, namely, quote, the calamitous history of colonialism, end quote. It is this history that Kentridge lived in apartheid South Africa. Importantly, the thought came to the artist only after he made the image. In trying to film a procession of shadows, he discovered that forward movement of the image becomes problematic. Move towards the light, the shadow grows and obliterates everything. In this medium, in other words, there can be neither advance nor retreat, but only passing. Retrospectively, the image got an idea, this political one, quote, the procession could not end with the fête galante on the Isle of Cythera of Vateau, nor could it arrive at a civic state nor a collective farm, end quote. Kentridge's second and more con important concern in revisiting Plato's cave is aesthetic. In Plato, the shadows represent the lowest order of being, poor images of crafted images, of physical things, chairs, whatever, that are themselves but images of their idea. To the prisoner who sees only them, shadows are not similar to anything. They refer to nothing and they evidence nothing but themselves. Shadows are ungraspable mentally and physically. There's no proper comprehension of their sense impressions. In stoic terms, no catalepsis of the phantasma that bombard the mind. The Warburgian philosopher of symbolic forms, Ernst Cassirer, used these shadows to picture what symbols are not. Quote, this is Cassira, without the symbol, the life of man would be like the prisoners in the cave of Plato's famous simile. Without the symbol, the life of man would be like the prisoners in the cave of Plato's famous simile." End quote. Kentridge has an interest in thinking otherwise. He writes, as an artist working in the field of illusion, I have a motive for trying to move images and hence illusions up the ladder and to show the place illusion has in the making of knowledge itself." End quote. Kentridge shows that the perception of shadows, and by extension the experience of crafted images, is never passive. Symbol making as a form of seeing as begins already in the cave. In the film, the shadows were cast by jointed bits of torn paper moved crudely frame by frame under the camera. They have only the barest resemblance to the figures in a procession and even less to, quote, specific people in Johannesburg, end quote. Yet to our delight, we mentally grasp figures nonetheless, perhaps more richly than had they been cut out with meticulous precision. Kentridge calls this meeting the world halfway. Quote, we see something we don't know that we know, something we recognize without knowing, end quote. This had been roughly Gombrich's point. Late Manor Titian and Gainsborough's ne nebulous forms give the beholder, in Gombrich's words, more to do, drawing him into the magic circle of creation and allowing him to experience something of the thrill of making that had once been the privilege of the artist." End quote. That's from Art and Illusion. Kentridge is a master of just such thrills. He finds in them a crack in Plato's edifice and, more importantly, a different politics. Kentridge omitted from his account the next step in Socrates' argument. Having beheld the sun, the prisoner takes pity on his former companions and wants to return to the cave to help them. But were he to do so, Socrates tells us, his eyes would be blinded by darkness. Out of practice with the shadow play, he would neither convince the prisoners of his adventure nor excel in a certain game they might play. This game is crucial to Socrates' exposition. Quote, the prisoners bestow on one another honors, commendations, and prizes for the man who is quickest to make out the shadows as they pass, and best able to remember their customary precedences, sequences, and coexistences, and so most successful in guessing at what was to come." End quote. That's Plato. 
Philosophers have long brooded on this peculiar competition in Plato. Plato vilifies it not only because of its emptiness, but because it foretells Socrates' murder. Were the enlightened inmate to return, the other prisoners would likely kill him if they could. But what is the game about? The shadow competitors are prognosticators who predict the future, so the players resemble astronomers. They are also experts in formal order, and so they also resemble lawyers. But it's tempting to tunnel back to what may well be the primeval substratum of Plato's allegory. Early Homo sapiens fled into caves for safety, and they drew on their walls images of the dangerous world outside. Remember Warburg, du lebst und tust mir nichts. In the cave dwellers' abode, the shadow diviners would be the priests engaged in the ordering, uh, ordering activities of myth, ritual, and art. From this perspective, the cave dweller's agon is a metaphor for culture itself. This was the argument of the philosopher Hans Blumenberg. Blumenberg sought to describe Plato's shadows by way of what he termed a phenomenological reduction. In such a reduction, one suspends judgment about the existence of an external world. Blumenberg imagined a life world that knows only shadows and nothing about the puppets, the bearers, or the illuminating fire. In such a life world, shadows would function, as the agon admits they can, as symbols. Contrary to Plato and Kassirer, then, shadows are the building blocks of a world that requires no fundamental ontology. It is the world that art and science continue to build. Kentridge thinks, I think, along these lines. Where Plato deems shadows worthless because they evidence only themselves, the artist embraces their limitation as a precarious resource of his art. Seeing, say, a megaphone in a drawing and also mistaking it for a speaking mouth, a dunce cap, a traffic cone, the cone of vision, a Dadaist prop, etc., all this sparks an awareness of our agency in apprehending the world and perhaps also our agency in changing the world. For Kentridge, the cave is primarily a metaphor for that other home for the image, though, the studio, with a camera and lights on one side, drawings on the other, and the maker shuttling back and forth in between, Kentridge's own workspace has a peculiar kinship with Plato's sonography. But then, by the artist's account, uh, Plato's cave also recollects a mine, the black box of an old bellows camera, the underground chamber near Johannesburg where the fossilized remains of our ancestor Homo Nalendi were unearthed, the diagram of the Brooks uh, slave ship here in a drawing of it by Kentridge, a cylinder mirror glass in reverse, a darkened theater like the one at Harvard where he spoke, and so on in a growing chain of associations that has shaped the imagery of his drawings, films, installations, and opera productions. Yet despite such expansiveness, the cave is also an image of entrapment and isolation. It begs the question of escape. Quote, I walk around the studio, an endless circling of that space, end quote. To focus this question, I turn to what for me is Kentridge's greatest creation to date, the 1994 film Felix in Exile. This clip lasts about four minutes.
It's always hard to speak after such a great thing, but <coughs> permit me. Um, speaking here at the Warburg Institute, I'm tempted to characterize briefly Kentridge's iconography. The clip abounds in images that invite interpretation. The rotating drum, the suitcase, the surveyor's instruments, the stars and their constellations, a sink plug, a water tap, all pose puzzles though not in a completely vexing way. The imagery unfolds not as events do in the world, but as thoughts might do in a dream, and in dreams we, after all, expect the unexpected. Also in dreams, the enigmas aren't completely random. Through similarities and proximities, the film's images intimate a larger architecture. The enigmatic rotating drum is a drawing instrument and relates to the proliferating drawings, the sheets of newspaper, the surveyor sketching, and the film itself, which is drawn. Reminiscent of a seismograph, the drum pertains to the scarred and fissured landscape setting. Reminiscent of a cardiograph, it also applies to matters of the heart. Metaphor and synecdoche abound, as they do, according to Freud, in the so-called dream work. The raw materials of dreams, memories, wishes, bodily stimuli, are transformed into the puzzling but urgently felt dream that is dreamt. Something like a dream or stream of consciousness would be one sufficient definition, I think, of the film's basic program. The film's iconography is also dreamlike. Images condense and displace meanings, and meanings are overdetermined because partly concealed. Kentridge did turn one of his dreams, image by image, into a film, but the sequence of imagery in Felix in Exile has a different origin. Created without a storyboard, the film uh, uh, arose out of the so-called Stone Age method, which we discussed earlier. Kentridge looks at the drawing that stands before him. Then following the tiniest impulse to draw, he makes one minute intervention with his charcoal or eraser before returning to his camera to capture it. The image prop prompts the next mark, the resulting image prop prompts another, and so on in unplanned succession. Kentridge spent many days drawing Soho Eckstein in bed with a tray, lowering the plunger of his cafetiere. On automatic pilot, as it, he were, as it were, he found himself unwittingly continuing the plunger's movement, millimeter by millimeter, down through the tray, through the bed sheets, and into the depths of the mines under Johannesburg. An astonishing segment of animation, the sequence was also a revelation to Kentridge, though uh, through it he found the subject of his 1991 film titled Ma Mine. Of course, the artist together with his editor, Angus Gibson, revised and reshaped the material. 
Deft editing characterizes Kentridge's oeuvre as a whole. Despite his prodigious output, he operates with a limited set of motifs, which he shapes and curates by recasting in different plots, contexts, and media. Each new me motif is carefully launched, often as a protagonist of a new, a new project. Thus, for example, the image of a profile outline of a nose had its first public release as the comic hero of Kentridge's production, The Nose. Having accumulated multiple value through Gogol's, Gogol's story and Shostakovich's opera, that image could be reused in drawings, prints, tapestries, and in monumental public sculpture. In Felix in Exile, the land surveyor, Nandi, is a new character. Introduced into a plot established in earlier films and endowed now with her own poignant story, she is set to reappear in later works with a rich iconography attached. Kentridge's images become so saturated in ideas and contexts that unpacking any one of them would take up an entire lecture. While this may be true of any great artist, Kentridge has one arrow in his quiver that sets him apart. Those peculiar creations, part sketch, part film, that he releases under the title of Drawings for Projection give each image a fabulous, rich backstory. What a simple drawing would do, have to do all at once, or at most in relationship to other works and texts displayed along with it, a drawing in projection has time to develop into an entire narrative in unfolding pictures, words, and music. Cafetiere, megaphone, bedsheets, surveyor's tools, etc., aren't merely symbols, as in an iconographer's dream, they arrive with an entire plot, allegory, and program attached. Kentridge gives three alternative accounts of the origin of his drawings for projection. By one account, they arose from his apprenticeship in the early 1980s in cinema and from an urge to make films cheaply and independently. By another account, they offered the artist an escape from the relentless pace of art making, quote, I could see my life ahead of me, so I decided I had to do something for my own pleasure, end quote. By a third account, the drawings for projection were chance byproducts of his using a camera to capture changes made to a drawing, both for his own personal interest and for future works. Invited to exhibit one of these films, he agreed to do so, but only as a sideshow to the exhibited final drawing. The public liked the film, however, and thus the animated films were launched. Drawings for projection are typically premiered with an exhibition of the drawings from which they were made. Felix in Exile used no less than 40 such sheets, some worn out by up to 500 changes and erasures. The film, in other words, is the main attraction, and the drawings are salvaged and collectible residue. But this hierarchy can be reversed. The films can be viewed as windows onto the secret history of the drawing. Every great drawing has a fascinating backstory, and it is only Kentridge's genius to capture it. As someone who reads into the drawings of Dürer and Bosch intricate stories about their motivation, I find this an appealing thought. I would like, therefore, to turn to three of the drawings in Felix in Exile. The film opens with an image of the landscape around Johannesburg, a desolate waste punctuated by rutted roads, property markers, culverts, stagnant ponds, and at the horizon, flat top uh, slag heaps. Kentridge has reflected on how this inhospitable terrain, called the Veld, is a mutable human artifact. Here, mountains appear and disappear depending on the fluctuating price of gold. And here, children play in the sand uh, playing in the sand can get swallowed up by hidden mine shafts. In winter, the felled fires reduce the grass to black stubble. Quote, it becomes a charcoal drawing in itself, writes Kentridge. You could drag a piece of paper across the ground and a charcoal drawing would be made, end quote. The film's next image moves us from the outside world to an interior, to a windowless cave-like room where Felix sits, naked and in exile, sifting through the content of a, a suitcase. In the suitcase are drawings, and the first drawing shows a body in the feld. A 
originally, initially, this image seems to take us back to the Feld. But by way of the flying sheets of newspapers, how they morph into drawings, the image of the body turns into one of the sketches in the suitcase. Multiplying until they are more than any box can contain, these sheets fly around through the space and stick to the flypaper walls. Hung with these images, the room becomes like an artist's studio, or perhaps like an exhibition of Kentridge's drawings for Felix in exile. The artist modeled his drawing, and there you ha have the drawing with the, with the drawings on the wall. The artist modeled his drawing of Felix's room after a photo of suprematist abstractions. Installed in 1915 in the show titled Last Futurist Exhibition of Painting 0.10, Malevich's squares announced the world's new beginning from zero through the agency of his art. Kentridge replaces the utopian black squares with drawings of sad longing and reduces their audience to one. This gesture has a topical charge. Kentridge made the film during the months leading up to South Africa's first democratic elections in April 1994. The artist's protagonist's melancholy exile in his cave or studio reflects perhaps an inner emigration set off against the political violence occurring outside. But while registering the paralysis of white activism in post-apartheid South Africa, perhaps, the first image, the drawing of the body in the Feld, is of an older and more personal provenance. It refers to a specific object that haunts Kentridge's art like a trauma. When Kentridge was six years old, he relates, he once entered his father's studio and saw a box, like a box of chocolates. Carefully opening the lid, he found instead of candies, a sheaf of black and white photographs. Quote, this is him speaking, uh, William Kentridge. A man lies face downward, a dot and dark stain in the center of his checkered jacket. The next photograph, the man rolled over, an incomprehensible confusion of shirt, jacket, viscera, the whole chest disintegrated by the exit wound of the bullet." End quote. What the child discovered were Ian Barry's photos of the Sharpeville massacre. In 1960, on the 21st of March, 69 black protesters were killed when police fired at a crowd in Sharpeville. Kentridge's father, Sir Sidney Kentridge, was the chief lawyer representing the families of the murdered protesters at an inquest held in 1961. Quote, the photos were part of evidence presented at court, Kentridge exclaims, noting, the court exonerated the police, end quote. The inquest hinged on an interpretation of events, whether, as police claimed, the um, inexperienced officers confronted by a surging crowd panicked and opened fire spontaneously, or whether the police deliberately used excessive force to prevent a gathering of black protesters. The evidence that the images were enlisted to give was about the direction of the shots. From the disposition of the bodies and the shape of the bullet wounds, one could deduce whether the victims were converging on the shooter or fleeing. Sidney Kentridge's charge was to use the image as evidence that the state was culpable for their death. Felix in Exile, in Felix in Exile, Kentridge outlines the body in the Feld in red chalk line, like the chalk or tape outline of a crime scene or like a marked up crime photograph. Throughout the artist's oeuvre, red marks have this distinct forensic charge. Nine days after the shooting, the South African government declared a state of emergency, arresting about 20,000 people and sending the black opposition parties underground. After the state of emergency was lifted, the legal order itself was changed, either by legislative acts amending the general law or by executive order. Whatever evidence the photographs presented entered into a kind of legal vacuum. Apartheid South Africa claimed to be a legal state, a polity based on integrity, predictability, and the rule of law, but it often ruled through emergency powers, suspending the law and enacting new laws contradictory to the legal norm. Sir Sidney Kentridge played a leading role in the most significant political trials in apartheid South Africa, including the treason trial of Nelson Mandela 
and the 1978 inquest into Stephen Biko's death. During his childhood, William Kendridge could observe firsthand the workings of an unjust state. South Africa illustrated the thesis proposed by Carl Schmitt that the juridical norm does not merely have a place for states of exception in the form of emergency power clauses. The norm is itself generated by the exception. Moreover, the South African state had built into it a feature at odds with a constitutional state. In place of a principle of equality of all citizens, the system of apartheid sanctioned a separation of races with different rights, rights for whites and blacks, what Schmidt, you'll recall, termed Artgleichheit, or equality of kind. Kentridge reports that the Sharpeville police were exonerated. Not just the studio, but the courtroom, too, is a version of the Platonic Cave. There, victory in the agon goes not necessarily to truth or justice, but to who who argues quickest about the shadows. In the cave of justice, the evidence of images did not at first prevail. As Kentridge notes, quote, the presence of a father who was a lawyer was not incidental. It became imperative to make something, a self, impervious to cross-examination to assert the primacy and the necessity of stupidity that is essential in the studio." End quote. The six-year-old closed the box, put it back on the shelf, put a box on, box, book on top to conceal what he had done. It is more, quote, it is more than this should not happen. This should not be seen. He should not have seen it, end quote. The evidence of images is immediate and traumatic. Once seen, it cannot be put away, but returns involuntarily as memories and melancholia. The traces are indelible even if the truth proved insufficient in a court of law. Unacceptable and unaccepted, the evidence of images provokes not consent, but dissent. That I should not see. Dissent finds its voice in revolutionary politics, but it can also find a powerful expression in art. In the studio, Kentridge takes up the evidence that, in the courtroom, did not yet prevail. Felix in exile shows the body disappearing into the feld, first drawn and outlined as evidence, then concealed by those gathering sheets of paper. The corpse becomes part of the landscape, yet another scar in the mutable terrain. Quote, the landscape is an unreliable witness, writes Kentridge. It is not that it effaces all history, but events must, ex but events must excavate, excavate, sought after its traces. They must be excavated, sought after in traces, in half-hidden clues." End quote. The artist mines the, the landscape for evidence. Over several months, he made a series of drawings in charcoal, ink, and forensic red on old handwritten mining ledgers. In them, he explored the Feld in an astonishing array of variations, but always in, in pursuit of traces and clues. Here, the red cones and circles refer to a massacre that had just occurred. On the 16th of August, 2012, the leadership of the National Union of Miners, backed up by police, opened fire on wildcat strikers uh, in Maracana. Four 44 were killed the most uh, legal use, uh, lethal use of force since Sharpeville. Created on the 19th of August, 2012, Kentridge's drawing is a palimpsest, reaching from the investigation right then underway through the killings of August 16th, uh, three days before, via the photos and the events of Sharpeville in 1960, back to 1905, when the underlying East Rand mine uh, cash book was inscribed with all those legible notes about native European and coolie wages. The image's ground goes even further than this. As Kentridge exclaim, explains, mining in Johannesburg began 130 years before when a seam of gold was discovered and the city was born. Its shafts, the deepest anywhere in the world, penetrate the, the earth where two million years ago, our earliest humanoid ancestors died and were preserved in dolomite caves. Deeper still, they reach where two billion years ago, a meteor struck the ground, 
tilting the layer of the Earth's crust containing the gold. Evidence gets absorbed into the landscape, but it never completely disappears. The drawings for projection do more than illustrate this persistence through stories and pictures. They evidence it in every single frame. Again, Kentridge creates his animations by adding to and subtracting from the same drawing. He works in charcoal, both because of its tonal range, reminiscent of old black and white films, and because its marks are easy to erase. However, the charcoal also leaves behind a bit of residue that, lodged within the cellulose fiber of the paper, cannot be wholly eradicated. An action uh, behind a wake of images, uh, an action that leaves behind a wake of images like a skipping stone. This ghostly trail gives every movement a palpable duration and tra trajectory. It also means that all marks and erasures remain permanently visible. The body that at first lay exposed remains faintly detectable under the newspapers. Kentridge reports that he first thought this to be a technical deficiency. Quote, I caught every kind of eraser, even an electric one. I tried to use shiny paper, different materials. It took me about a year and a half to understand that the erasures were part of the film. More than that, they were part of their meaning and part of their interest. They had to do with the sense of things, end quote. What does Kentridge mean by the erasures being part of the sense of things? The word sense encompasses practical sense, moral sense, aesthetic sense, as well as visual sensation. It con connotes a movement towards something, here presumably towards the ineffable whole of the artist's intentions. Kentridge's phrase fits the fugitive presence of the charcoal marks, and it also fits the images themselves. Images may be diverg uh, divergent in the sense we make of them, but they are persistent and conspicuous nonetheless. Instead of truth, they give us a sense of things. More concretely, the fact that charcoal can't be completely erased affirms a fragile utopian hope underlying his art. Kentridge often evokes the reflections of the 19th century German scientist named Felix Eberti. Eberti postulated that light illuminating every event moved out from Earth at 186,000 miles per second. Thus, if someone were to stand at the right point in space, they could observe every event that ever, ever happened. Near a star 500 years away, Hieronymus Bosch is being buried and mourned. A bit further off, he is opening the wings of his triptych to its astonished viewers. Quote, the air is thick with images, writes Kentridge. Time made dense with each event and its image, as if one could take a sheet of paper and swing it through the air, catching the images as they crash into it." End quote. Kentridge's 2012 installation, The Refusal of Time, updates this thought experiment through the science of black holes. Though they suck up everything that approaches their event horizon, including light, black holes are believed by most physicists to preserve all the information they swallow. This hope that evidence will remain extends to the image maker himself who, quote, transmits, projects, and broadcasts himself continually, here I am, here I am, here I am. Plato's allegory hinges on a paradox. The prisoner released from his bonds comes to see that he once lived in a cave. His fellow prisoners will not understand him, however. Having beheld only shadows, they do not know what a cave is. How then to mediate that knowledge? One answer is, you create an image, the image of the cave, say, and you ask the shadow experts mentally to behold it. Although Plato vilifies likenesses, Plato's allegory is, ex is itself an extended likeness. Through the image of the cave, it gives evidence about what, other not, what not otherwise cannot be known. Quote, drawing a body in the feld, Kentridge writes, I start with a reference for the drawing, a photograph of the body. Only after I was finished did I remember the Sharpville photographs." End quote. The drawing in Felix in Exile isn't a sketch of one of the photographs in Sidney Kentridge's studio. The studio makes that earlier image only evident again. Quote, I remembered what, had been, what I had been drawing long after the drawing was finished. 
hope rests in the act of drawing, which is both a making and a beholding. Quote, the activity of drawing itself, the concentration shifts position, the image becomes a series of marks and decisions. The person shot, the provoking shot, disintegrates into the tone, the line, the contrast of the drawing, right up against the paper. The activity of finding the image is just the material and the belief that this material will transform itself back into the image." End quote. Material that is not yet an image, that is the degree zero of the shadows. They look like nothing and they point to nothing. Discovering again the body in the Feld, that image which should not have been seen, Kendridge dissolves it back into the Feld, back into the page, but with the hope that it will remain evident still. Although he works in the exile of his studio, a cave, Kentridge may be the one who has seen the Feld, seen the world, and returned to the cave to give evidence, the evidence that images alone can give. This evening, in our ex and in our explorations of Beckman and Bosch, I've only tried to meet the image halfway. And it's been a great honor to do this, and I thank you for your long patience. <laughs>